Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. I warned you this day would come. We are speaking with my progressive friend, Eric Liu. He's the president of Citizen University. He's going to say a lot of things that I disagree with, that you disagree with, but you're going to be disturbed at how much we actually agree as well. So check it out. You've never been to a dead show, so maybe you're maybe you're at a loss for what that even means. I've listened to enough uh, bootleg recordings of dead shows. So. You, now you play violin, right? Yeah, yeah, I um, still do a bit. How much? I saw that you were playing. Was it, it was a Kennedy Center Center thing you were doing? Is that correct? You saw a video of that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> was it bootleg? Was I not allowed to see that? No, I mean it wasn't. It was, it was all sort of a surprise. Uh, yeah, I yeah. happened to have my violin and. Uh, um, so you are you uh, classically trained? This is where your love for classical music comes yeah, from? Yeah, I played classical violin all through uh, much of college, actually. I yeah. took lessons all through high school, played in, you know, in college. And uh, uh, about halfway through college, realized it was a bit too much time commitment. And I was uh, loving it, but not loving it that much. Yeah. You know, uh, I was a, I was a horrible musician. I. I played saxophone in a jazz band in high school, <laughs> but I had zero discipline. I, I I never did my homework, so I I just I just sucked. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Now I think one of the great things about uh, violin was not so much. I mean, of course, all the the things you'd expect of discipline and practice and all that stuff. But uh, it was being in an orchestra. Yeah. Um, I actually still miss that. I I, I still play. You know, just uh, on my own uh, every few weeks, just to make sure I haven't totally lost it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but what I really miss is that feeling of ensemble, right? Yeah, and that yeah. feeling of kind of just reading where other people are and having a sense of, uh, um, you know, this, this idea, which is a metaphor that maybe I've used with you before, that, you know, you learn in symphony uh, that you can lead from any chair. Yeah. Right? Right. Um, you're not, not just if you're the... Uh, concert master, the head of the section, or whatever. But if you're way back in the second violins, and you hear people around you kind of falling off the beat, or you know, if you just start leaning in and start playing a little louder and start picking them up, you know, it, uh, uh, it it's both a form of contagion from that spot, but it's also it's leadership yeah, yeah. from from within, right? And and those that, <clears throat> that's a good that's a good launching off point because metaphors like that, um, it I. I, I love that metaphor, and I and I agree with it, and it conjures up all sorts of uh, notions of uh, of how order emerges mm-hmm. in a in a in a body. Yeah, a um, bunch of individuals somehow yeah. come together and do something. But we should probably warn our audience because because <laughs> um, once they figure out who you are, and once <laughs> once your audience figures out who I am, everyone's going to be triggered and angry and. <laughs> And even setting as, our instruments on fire. And yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. I, I think I told you last week that you, that you would put your career and your credibility on the line by 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 coming on this show. Yeah, but, yeah. But we've done this before. Yeah. And we. This is all Photoshop. This is not yeah, real. Yeah. Apparently, is, we've yeah. survived so far. <laughs> but uh, you know, you're you're on the opposite side of the ideological spectrum for me, and we can, we and I'll, I'll accept that sort of left right thing for now, and maybe we'll pick that apart later. But. Uh, Tell us a little bit about who you are. You served two tours of duty in the in the Clinton administration, mm-hmm. and and your your resume kind of reads like a who's who of, of of modern progressivism. And I don't even know if you accept that term, but yeah. But tell us about you. Yeah. Um, uh, so I uh, founded and run uh, an organization called Citizen University now, and this is a nonpartisan nonprofit that uh, th- through which we've played together. Um, that's all about activating bottom-up citizen power uh, and teaching folks how to understand the exercise of power uh, wherever they may be and actually wherever they may be, they may be on the political spectrum as well, right? And so yeah. um, we've engaged uh, people who range from you and other uh, libertarian leaders, reform conservatives, uh, as well as people who have been leaders and founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, the Fight for 15, um, you name it, at many points uh, – both between and uh, and orthogonal to that to that axis, right? Uh, that, that that's my job right now. But and my, I've spoken at that, and you've spoken and at our conferences, got, gotten out alive been, several times. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, in fact, made made a bunch of friends. And uh, um, uh, but my path to that work 
um, comes, as you say, out of politics. Um, I'd worked for President Clinton uh, two different times. I was a speechwriter for him in his first term, and then I was a, his deputy uh, domestic policy advisor in the, in the second term um, and uh, have worked for Democrats at various points. Uh, President Obama appointed me to the uh, board of uh, what's called the Corporation for National and Community Service, which is the parent entity of uh, AmeriCorps and Vista and Senior Corps programs like that. Um, and uh, and just in my own life as a citizen, uh, I live in Seattle. Um, uh, I've uh, co-founded a very a, conservative place. Yeah, very. Yeah. You know, one of the reddest super, places you'll find. Super uh, conservative. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, in Seattle, I was the co-founder of something called the Alliance for Gun Responsibility. Um, which uh, an organization, a grassroots group that we founded after Sandy Hook, um, which has since successfully um, passed several statewide ballot measures on gun reforms. Uh, and I was pretty active also um, in, in helping Seattle become the first major city to enact a $15 minimum wage. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so my politics, uh, my policy preferences uh, are generally uh, pretty progressive. Um, my civic mentality uh, especially in the times that we're living in right now, um, is not doctrinaire, is not party line, but is very much about figuring out um, how do we, which both means you and me, uh, but people, you know, your viewers and people who watch a lot of my stuff, how do we actually save our republic right now right. in a time where norms and institutions uh, um, are, are starting to break down? Um, and that requires actually breaking out of that tribalism. So I've, I've warned our audience that that we are going to have all sorts of conversations on this show, and I'm I'm specifically trying to curate um, conservatives and libertarians who have all sorts of differences, mm -hmm. particularly now, and and progressives and and people that don't even identify as any of those things, um, and and the goal is just that, and I I say it quite simply, you know, can't we all just get along, like? What's going on? Um, it, I, I share your view that, that things feel particularly hostile right now. And I have some theories about why that might be, and you do as well. But, but I, I think we're, we're in this process of, of people from all over the place sort of realizing, you know, we better figure this out. We better figure out uh, why we're so angry. Uh, we better figure out why we feel like our, our system is so dysfunctional. And you know, I see it. I saw it in the Tea Party movement. Mm -hmm. I saw it before that with the Ron Paul movement. Um, but now I see it with Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I see it in, in Trump's movement as well. There's there's anxiety. There's there's this belief that that I don't completely buy into that that our best days are behind us. I don't I don't think that's actually true. I think I think by a lot of objective measures, things are better than they've ever been. So that's that's why we're having this conversation, and that's why this looks like a living room. Because if if we were on Fox <laughs> News, we would be required to shout at each other. Yeah, and that's that's actually I was laughing as re reminded of that of the debate that we had. Yeah, debating. how we met. Yeah, yeah, and and I think our host was angry because we started agreeing on a couple yeah, things. Exactly. <laughs> and it was actually a um, it was actually a a panel on hyperpartisanship, and yeah. they and they created it so yeah. that. We would fight with each other. Well, it was you and George Will against me and a, a, a progressive a political scientist named Chris Parker. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. And you and I just kept on messing it up, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and not even so much agreeing on policy per se, but more agreeing, uh, like, like you're saying, on, um, well, first of all, on disposition. That I mean, we were just getting along, but also uh, uh, agreeing that there are certain ways in which our system is broken that don't fit into a left-right grid. Yeah. Uh, so neatly and um, and that it behooves us to actually figure out what that is. Right. Um, and that, uh, um, yeah, that can make for um, a lot of disappointed producers, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. when, when you're set up for cage cage match uh, combat. Right. I went back on MSNBC after that. Um, thinking that we might have a civil conversation and, and the guy just took my head off. Oh, really? <laughs> and it was, it was one of the, it was one of the guys from, uh, um, indivisible huh. and, and I've since, uh, I think you actually connected me yeah. with them since then, yeah. but, but you know, the, the assumption on his part is that we're, I'm a tea party guy and we're going in and we're going to have a war. And I, I have actually written some fairly sympathetic things about indivisible uh, but I was reminded that if you go on MSNBC, you have to you have to yell at each other. It's just yeah. it's the rule. Yeah, 
Um, I, I think one of the things, you know, I mean, I'm curious what you're, you said you have some theories uh, about why, um, you know, there is this level of anger and anxiety. Um, uh, t- tell me what your thoughts are on that. Sure. I, I mean, I, I think that, that we are in the middle of a paradigm shift. And I think, I think uh, you know, I'm, I'm 55 years old and, and I grew up in a world where there were respected institutions that were very top down. You know, Walter Cronkite used to tell me that's the way it is every night. And there was a perfectly curated 23 minutes of news and there was three networks. And, and it was kind of the same thing on every network. Um, and, and your school and your government and even working at one place your, your entire life, everything was very structured and top down. And uh, because of technology, all of those institutions are falling apart. And, and I, frankly, I think that's a good thing. I, I like decentralization. I, I call myself a radical Democrat, um, although we may, we may quibble about what democracy really means. Mm-hmm. But I think we're in this process of figuring out how a radically democratized world is actually supposed to function. And all those guys I just mentioned are voices in politics that never had a voice before. Like there was, the, Ron Paul didn't have a voice before the internet. Mm-hmm. Um, you could say the same thing absolutely about AOC. Mm-hmm. And it turns out we don't fit neatly into two boxes. And, and my theory is we probably don't even fit in several dozen boxes and all these silos that, that politics creates today. So I, I, think, I think we're working it out, but I, I tend to be an optimist about about how people work things out. So, and, and, and we probably agree on some of that. Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, I, I agree for sure that we are in this tectonic shift uh, that technology is driving of democratization of everything, of voice, of uh, uh, media. I mean, you know, 15 years ago, you wouldn't even be doing this show, right? There right. would be no audience for this show, but there, there is now, and there are platforms for our conversation to go lots of places. Um, I, I think there's another force at work that's been for much of our lifetimes, uh, you know, at least the last four uh, plus decades. uh, And that is um, uh, a trend under both Democratic and Republican administrations uh, of uh, of this grinding, crunching inequality um, and concentration of wealth, voice, clout and power um, that has led lots of people rightly to feel like the game is rigged. Uh, and you alluded to it earlier. That's folks who love AOC and Bernie. That's folks who love Trump, uh, who, who both have some reason to point out that the game has been rigged. Either the capitalist game has been rigged by Wall Street for Wall Street to have, you know, capitalism for capitalists, but uh, uh, but not actually for all the people. Right. Uh, right. Uh, uh, or it's uh, uh, ways in which I mean, even apart from public policy, think about the contagious ways in which uh, when you have this level of inequality, you get kind of a contagion of status anxiety. You get this culture that's unfolded over the last 30 years where, you know, in uh, the upper middle class, everybody's anxious about getting their kid into the right preschool because all their life chances are going to be determined by that and, you know, all the way through college. And that kind of uh, starts creating this hoarding mentality, mentality, right? This sense of um, we're not in this together. Like, you know, screw you, right? Um, and, And that's even in the most privileged precincts. Uh, if you're in a community that has been just decimated by globalization, uh, where jobs have disappeared and uh, and there's no obvious uh, uh, hope for economic uh, prosperity or opportunity, um, you're not thinking about hoarding. You're just thinking about how completely screwed everyone around you is uh, and how completely tone deaf uh, a lot of political leaders of both parties have been in response to this, right? And so, uh, you know, to me, the surprise wasn't um, either the Tea Party, Occupy Wall Street, or Bernie, or Trump, uh, the surprise was, why didn't these things happen sooner, right? The, uh, the, the, this game has been rigged for quite a while now, and, uh, uh, you know, we would have different views about how to unrig that game, uh, but I don't think we would disagree that there is this feeling that fewer and fewer folks are, uh, uh, are hoarding more and more voice and opportunity right now, um, and there's this great pushback that's happening right now against yeah. that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know that. And I, and I watched a, a speech you just gave about about this about your idea that that you know essentially you're saying that the rich are getting richer and and, and wealth concentration at the top one percent is 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 is, it, is is much more than it have, has ever ever been before, or at least since right before the Great Depression. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I I think 
I think it's definitely true that that people are learning, you know, like a lot of their the romantic notions about how the system works have the, the bubble's been popped. Yeah. And that old Norman Rockwell painting. Yeah. Um, where you think that you go to a town hall mo- meeting and you have a voice, um, you, you're now learning because because you can Google stuff. Mm-hmm. You're now learning that 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 was always sort of a romantic notion and and it really doesn't work that way. And and you know the the guy that really gets a seat at the table with that member of Congress that you went at that town hall, that guy's got juice. Yeah, he's he's probably a, a corporate um, lobbyist. Yep. Or executive, or or, yeah. or he's the head of a labor union. You know, like all of those concentrated um, insider type games. I just think I don't think people knew about that stuff before. I mm-hmm. think it's always been going on. I think mm-hmm. I think in that sense the game has been rigged uh, for quite some time. So I feel like we're 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 discovering, and and it's it's unpleasant to right. discover that all of your romantic notions about our democratic republic aren't really true. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if you think uh, again, and, you know, we haven't talked so much about a movement like Black Lives Matter, but um, you just described a a lot of the motivations there as well. Right. In the African-American community, of course, it has been common knowledge (laughs) since time immemorial that uh, uh, cops will often uh, mistreat uh, unarmed black uh, uh, citizens uh, with impunity. But now we live in an age where that's getting recorded. Right. right. Uh, and where those recordings will spread virally. And now we're in an age where um, the, the, there actually are systematic studies about, you know, how that happens and what the patterns are, um, just like there are now systematic studies in economics about, you know, this feeling of, oh, the game seems rigged. Well, let me show you an actual chart. Right. right. That tells right. us that, you know, the last 11 years of our, quote, recovery since the Great Recession, 95 um, percent of the gains of that recovery have gone to the to the top one percent. Right. So if you haven't felt like there's been a recovery for you, that's probably because there hasn't been a recovery for you. Right. Uh, And that feeling that used to be just a, you know, a private feeling, something that you would express to people around you uh, is now, as you're saying, uh, both uh, provable and shareable uh, by facts, stats, images and and media that's that's on this democratized platform today right yeah. so that's changed and there were, you know there was these parallel movements you know i obviously was part of the tea party movement which which i absolutely maintain um, started in opposition to the wall street bailout the mm. the the story that you usually hear is that it started in opposition to barack obama um, but having been there from day one i i, I saw a seismic shift um, the day that that they voted in the House and it was defeated. And, and Nancy Pelosi and John Boehner were walking hand in hand down the aisle and they were going to bail out Wall Street. And, and members of Congress were just crushed with calls. Mm-hmm. And, and my question at the time is, what just happened? Something different is happening. And obviously what happened was, was uh, democratized uh, information. People found out in real time because you, normally you wouldn't find out until after Right, the, the deal the, was cut. The and, game was done. Yeah, um, but of course, it wasn't just the Tea Party movement. It was Occupy Wall Street, and it, it, and at least for a while, there was there was a there was a commonality there that that went off in very different ideological directions. But but let me go back because I, I this 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 phrase Black Lives Matter. Mm-hmm. This is this is something I'm sort of obsessed with because the language that the two teams use is so different. And I was actually part of, uh, you know, Glenn Beck. Um, we're, we're on Blaze TV, and Glenn was the first guest on this program. You went on his program. Well, you introduced me to Glenn. And, and, th- th- and I got all of us in trouble for that, too, I'm sure. <laughs> no, no, we, we've become friends. But a couple, um, I think it was 2013, 2014, I was with Glenn for a march in Alabama um, that, that was all about recognizing the, the, the struggles for um, equality under law there, but his slogan was all lives matter. And today Bill Weld would tell us, um, that all lives matter is a dog whistle for, um, I saw that subversive racism. Um, and I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think that's necessarily true, but I didn't understand what activists meant when they said black lives matter because my instinctual response was no 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 all lives matter Mm -hmm. and and what they were what they were trying to say um and you could 
they could hear it in their community, but maybe not in my community, was that uh, black lives don't matter enough, mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to policing. Right. And I agree with that 100%. Yeah. But, I, but I couldn't hear it. Yeah. I couldn't hear it. And that's, and so as, as I sort of ad admit that, I realize that um, a lot of the things that we say to each other, um, I'm not hearing what you're saying and you're not hearing what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's 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 one part of this conversation is like, um, you know, when I say rule of law, um, progressives hear something else. Mm -hmm. um, they hear uh, sort of the man coming down and and step, stepping on you with his boot. Yeah, and that's not what I mean. I mean equal treatment under the law. I mean like everybody should be treated the same, regardless of who your parents are, who you know in Washington. Yeah. And but so I don't like that phrase because I don't think it means what I'm trying to say. Yeah, you know I um, <clears throat> I really appreciate your articulation of um, how you started to see in that more kind of full spectrum way or hear in a full spectrum way what what activists were saying when they said Black Lives Matter. Right? Um, I, I always describe it as there are silent parentheticals uh, in that phrase. Right? It's it, when when people say Black Lives Matter, they're saying Black lives should matter as much as all lives under law, but they don't in context of policing or asset forfeiture or housing opportunities or redline, you name it, right? Um, and, um, and I think, uh, you know, there are certainly exactly mirror image ways of not hearing, uh, either willfully or um, unwittingly, um, when folks on the left do not hear folks on the right. I think it's actually been a product of our conversations uh, and our friendship. Um, for instance, you know, I, I would I would tell you, I not that many years ago had a very cartoon version of what libertarianism is, was, and means. Yeah. Right. Um, I read that. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah you know, yeah. and and it was good. You know, it was a well. Uh, you know, it, it, on its own terms, I made the argument that you know, lib libertarianism, by which I was basically implicitly saying radical libertarianism, mm -hmm. right is just as dangerous as radical communism, right? The kind of a blind doctrine that just believes that there's this only one way to do, do things and see things um, and just flips on its head the same faith that communists had uh, that uh, everything will be okay if you just follow this blind ideology, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I will confess, of course, that that is a, uh, uh, a, a very blunt caricature, that there are, of course, people um, who may fit that stereotype, but that's not actually... Um, well, certainly not you, and it's certainly not probably the heart of your uh, viewership and listenership here. And but but even beyond that, even beyond just kind of shedding the easy cartoon caricatures, um, <clears throat> you know, you said earlier you're a radical Democrat, right? Small D Democrat. Um, I am in many ways, but I'm also a bit of a uh, a civic Republican, small R Republican, right? Mm -hmm. I, I believe that a republic is held together by citizens who don't just think of themselves as um, atomistic individual consumers and so forth, but actually see themselves as having uh, b both a, a sense of responsibility and a sense of uh, uh, character to cultivate in, in common life, uh, and that if they and that absent that intentional cultivation of character and taking on responsibility, the whole thing starts to unravel, right? And as I've been thinking about that worldview, uh, I've of course been actually partly again at your behest. Uh, not just caricaturing libertarians, but reading libertarians, right? And, uh, uh, and you know, I, I will still, uh, any day of the week, make fun of Ayn Rand, mm -hmm. uh, but I will not make fun of Hayek anymore. Actually, you'll find a great deal in Hayek where I'm like, yeah, that actually quite expresses my sense of how complex adaptive systems um, uh, form, how, as you say, order spontaneously arises, about the dangers of trying, uh, uh, certainly from a distance, uh, to uh, overly determine uh, the, the, the shapes of those systems. Uh, but I couple that with the sense of um, if you're in that system, um, you can't just default to, hey, anything goes. Let, let, let the system unfold uh, without uh, 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 my action or intervention, right? Uh, you've got to take, again, responsibility and ask, is this market economy that we're in actually working for everybody? Like, in theory, capitalism should, but does the evidence of my eyes tell me that it is? And if not, do I have a responsibility to say something? Is this notion of equal justice under law actually playing out, right? Um, ideally, 
Um, it is, and it is because all of us are taking some responsibility. But if that's not happening, uh, what do I need to do to say something, to do something, to actually, you know, uh, stand with, march with folks who are uh, uh, protesting uh, against injustices, right? Um, and that sense of understanding um, both the power of bottom-up change, but also the responsibility that comes with it, uh, has grown out of a closer, more, uh, a less prejudged reading um, of some of what you would probably consider canonical texts, yeah. right? <clears throat> so I, I I went through that crisis. So you you know that I was um, I was really into Ayn Rand when I was a kid, and I read all those books. And she's actually the one that said t- to read the Austrians, <laughs> um, and and their perspectives are 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 very different for for a lot of reasons. But and I would defend her. I I think I think some of the language she use uses like selfishness is is. Com- Completely off-putting to someone that doesn't understand the context of of a young Russian girl that was escaping yes. um, authoritarianism under under the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, and so she was raging against the machine, and and she had come from this collectivist hellhole. In my, uh, you, you may characterize it differently, but she came from that, so she was like, "Well, screw the collective. I'm I'm an individual, and mm-hmm. no one's going to tell me what to do." And and all libertarians have that instinct, but you know, fast forward to Hayek and the in the Austrians. Uh, one of my professors at George Mason University used to talk about uh, the greater social intelligence, and it was very Hayekian point. Hayek talked about the spontaneous order, mm-hmm. which I call beautiful chaos, and with the emphasis on the beautiful, it doesn't look like it's going to work out, but it's it's it turns out that. Um, by leaving people free, there's a greater so- social intelligence. So I, I tend to be a lot more optimistic about about letting things just work out. But you talk about this trade-off. Um, you, you mention it all the time between liberty and, and equality. Mm-hmm. Talk about that. Yeah. Well, I, I will in a moment, but actually I, I, I'm ob- observing that you've used the word optimist or optimism like three or four times already in our short conversation. And, and um uh, I, I want to actually um, drill down a little bit on that because um, I, I often the tables use, are turned. <clears throat> well, no, I, I often use a, a a slightly different formulation. You know, to me, uh, optimism or pessimism um, it, it implies a bit of spectatordom, right? I, I, I'm an o- I'm optimistic that the Yankees are going to win the World Series this year, mm-hmm. right? But but I have actually very little to do with the outcome, right? All I can do is. Uh, either cheer or rage uh, as circumstances unfold that are pretty much out of my control. Um, the frame that I use more than optimism, pessimism, uh, is hopeful, not hopeful. Um, to me, my conception of hope, uh, and, and this is partly semantic, but I think it's worth spelling out. My, my conception of hope uh, implies not just spectator, it implies a little bit of agency, yeah. right? It implies that I actually have something to do with the outcome. And so I, I'm ho- I think you are hopeful, not just optimistic. Um, because you're not just sitting back uh, and saying, you know what, world's on fire, it's going to work out. Like, you know, fire will go out and something will grow out of that. Like, you, you, I think you have a bit more of a sense of both agency and responsibility uh, than, than pure sit back and, and, and enjoy the show. Um, but I have a lot more of that. Like, I, that, that, that is my DNA, right? right. And, and, and I think the, the, you know, where that gets into something like this trade-off between uh, liberty and equality um, uh, again, I mean, let's take a- Ayn Rand, right? I mean, a- Ayn Rand, you know, that, 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 um, that reaction that she had, um, to Soviet, uh, collectivist, uh, uh, structures, um, was a great encapsulation of when a society goes, uh, you know, liberty and equality are con- continuously in tension. When a society goes too far in one direction or the other, uh, dangerous, terrible things happen. Right. And uh, at least the early Soviet Union was a, a utopian fantasy that you could enforce equality um, from the top down uh, in ways that very quickly became cynical about, you know, equality for me and not for thee. Right. But, but still, it was this kind of enforced state structure of equality, which by definition had to trample on most people's liberty. Right. Um, and at the other extreme, if you go all the way to I, I want just absolute liberty, everybody should be able to do whatever the heck they want. Um, you know, even even with your stricture of if as long as they don't hurt people, right? Um, or, that, t- or take their or stuff. take their, well, yeah, but that taken to an extreme as well. Uh, the trade-off is okay. You are about to accept massive levels of inequality, 
right? Many of which may be inherited, unearned, or um, you know, uh, uh, unwanted. Um, and so, to me, a healthy society is always in this trade-off zone and trying to figure out. Okay, you know, again, the metaphor I often use is, is a garden metaphor. The gardens of democracy, mm-hmm. right? We are gardeners, uh, and gardens, you know, gardens don't self-weed and self-feed and self-tend, right? They do have beautiful chaos. They do have spontaneous order. There will be growth. You know, my staring at a garden and saying, grow, grow faster, you know, won't make it grow faster. Uh, but uh, and, and so I acknowledge that that is arising from the bottom up. You, you, but can't, you can't dictate to the bees. I can't to dictate pollinate. to the bees, but I can decide what ought to be planted where. And I can notice that when ivy and other noxious weeds start coming in, I probably ought to do something about that. Right. And these trade offs between liberty and equality are trade offs of gardening. Like, how much do you want your garden to be kind of wild and, you know, beautiful? But, yeah, sometimes dandelions will will, will take over this corner and you can be all right with that versus, you know, how much do you want it to be super well tended and hyper orderly? And uh, again, I, you know, if you put aside the extremes of, you know, pure random chaos of uh, Mogadishu right now, which, I, you know, is is liberty at its finest. <laughs> Everybody at liberty to do, uh, you know, people are free to. Um, hide from gangs. People are free to live, uh, you know, in rubble and so forth. Uh, and the Soviet extreme uh, on the other side, if you put aside those and you think about, well, what are we trying to build in this zone here? Um, it's this tug and this pull. It's this mix of, it's not even like splitting the difference between you and me. There are times where your approach is going to be way more appropriate. There are times where my approach is going to be way more appropriate. There are times where things have gotten a little out of control and you're going to need to put on gloves and get in there and garden and weed. There are other times where, you know what, dude, you are just ruining it by getting your hands in there all the time and, uh, you know, and, and keeping the thing from growing. And your approach ought to be taking some precedence. Right. I think that is um, uh, that's our responsibility as citizens is to understand that bigger picture. And again, it's, I think, why we've been learning from each other, even if it's not uh, particularly agreeing all the time. Yeah, so the so we had a guest on uh, a couple weeks ago, Megat Wade. She's a businesswoman from from Africa. And she, uh, she she gave just an amazing TED talk about about um, the lack of of what she would call the rule of law, but she's really talking about, you know, the inability to start a legal business mm-hmm. in Senegal. And and the, a lot of my free market friends in in Africa, and the first thing they complain about is is a lack of rule of law. Like if if you if you start a business, um, it's quite possible that local law enforcement is going to come loot your business, and and there there's no there's no rules, there's no predictability, the court systems don't work. Um, so the you know the the question going back to um, I'm not I'm not totally buying. The idea that Mogadishu is, has too much liberty, um, but the the question is how do you, how do you get to that? How do you get to the rule of law? Mm. Is this is this a top down construct, mm. um, um, as you might suggest the founders of this country mm. did, or is it something that could be done from the bottom up? And and Hayek would argue um, that you know as as radical as the founders were in terms of of giving the individual a voice. In our system, um, that they were they were stealing those yes. ideas back hundreds of years. You bet. And and Hayek, Hayek would argue that that what we call the rule of law is really just spontaneously evolved rules of the game that that people figure out over time. They figured out not to kill each other because it wasn't good for themselves. They figured out not to steal from each other. Um, somebody somewhere decided over. Uh, trial and error, which side of the road to drive on. Uh, all that stuff was spontane- spontaneously emergent, uh, common law kind of stuff. And and I don't know that you can just airdrop that in mm-hmm. to a, another culture and see it take hold. But but that's really what we're arguing about because I, I don't I don't want chaos. Um, I don't I don't want violence. I don't want gang rule. Um, but how do you get people to respect the rules? And I, I don't think you can actually do it at the point of a gun. I think it has to be a community accepted system so that people don't want to break the rules. It's a really um, big question. And I think um, I think a lot of uh, so two things first about the United States and then and then thinking more broadly around the world. 
You know, you're absolutely right, and, and Hayek was as well, that um, the founders did not, you know, uh, come up with these ideas themselves. Uh, they were not, they did not, you know, were not fully formed uh, uh, apostles of uh, liberty and equality uh, without any precedent. I mean, you don't even have to go back hundreds of years before them. You know, of course, they looked at Roman uh, and Greek examples, but um, just the English lineage uh, of an unwritten constitution and bills of rights and the glorious revolution of 1688 and all of these kind of milestones in a gradual evolution in, uh, in the English tradition um, of rights against the sovereign, rights of parliament, representation, voice, right? And, um, and in many ways, what the colonists and ultimately the founders um, were expressing to <clears throat> the British was, um, you know, we are, only, we are actually being more faithful to the English creed uh, that we've inherited than you are, right? This is exactly the creed. Uh, that led people one, two, three, four generations ago in England uh, to push against the king and to uh, and to uh, secure rights uh, for the people through Parliament. Um, that, to me, we got to remember. Uh, and you talk about inheritances that you shouldn't squander or blow. Um, that is a rare, exceptional thing that the United States inherited, right? It is not. There is a reason why it's not easy. You know, post Arab Spring, post lots of opportunities where. You know, the collapse of a <clears throat> dictator, the end of tyranny um, in most places does not actually yield um, effective self-government. Um, and the reason why is that there is often in these places no prior foundation of habits, norms, traditions, history um, of that kind of self-government. Um, and so uh, in the United States, we had that. And the founders uh, themselves were the product of that, not the creators of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, uh, and. Uh, so that's number one about us in the United States. But, you know, your thing about <clears throat> you can't do it at, at the point of a gun, I think is probably right. But, you know, the only other ways that you think about in modern times where it, it has successfully happened that a, a country or a culture that didn't previously have these norms, the rule of law, um, respect for these kinds of institutions, then develops it is not exactly the point of a gun, but it is often after a calamity. Right. So Japan, after the Second World War, um, under our occupation, um, developed these systems, these institutions, the rule of law and so forth in this way. Uh, Taiwan, uh, the nationalists flee the mainland during the Chinese Civil War. Uh, and they're, the, the, you know, this is my family that they end up in Taiwan, um, which, uh, uh, you know, and there was that was a bit of a point of a gun because there was martial law in Taiwan uh, for, for many, many decades. Uh, but because of that calamity uh, and because uh, th they were literally on an island, uh, they were able to build <clears throat> uh, a framework for the rule of law that now makes Taiwan a real you know, vision of what China's future could be if they ever um, if the Communist Party were ever to loosen its grip. Right. Yeah. Um, but those are those are the exceptions. I, I think far more of the rule is something like Iraq after Saddam. Um, or Egypt after the Arab Spring, um, places where, uh, you know, there is no prior tradition. And just thinking, it's naive just to think, oh, we got rid of the dictator. Yay, yeah. self-government, democracy, right? Um, and rule of law. Um, I, I think- There's there's an arrogance yeah. to that perspective. And there I, is. And again, I'll show my libertarian leanings. I This, this idea that, that we can sort of- um, bomb the crap out of another country, take out the dictator and and set up voting voting booths and think it's all going to be okay is is so arrogant and 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 talk about central planning like this this idea that <laughs> that you can come in and re-engineer things from the top down. But, you know, the uh, to go to go back to your earlier point about hope versus optimism, you know, I just spent a lot of time um, speaking to youth groups across the world and I think I think the answer, at least the best one I have, is is not to impose a set of values or a set of of, of things on other people, but you could lead by example, and and try to show them what works and what doesn't work in our system, and and to to change hearts and minds, and and that's that's really what you do for a living. You're 
you're you're you're out there organizing citizens and and you're teaching them about power. The name of your last book was "You're More Powerful Than You Think." Mm-hmm. Um, how do we how do we empower citizens, not just in this country, but I but I think I think it is a, a responsibility that people have to take. Mm-hmm. Um, if if you don't if you don't like um, your your country being devastated by gangs. What are you going to do about it? <clears throat> and that's an easy question to ask. Yeah. I, I, I've and whether the gangs people. are, you know, Wall Street banksters or, uh, you yeah. know, uh, inner city gangsters, I, th- I think the, 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 the same question applies. Um, you know, I, I, I think the uh, another area where I think we have um, a quite a bit of overlap uh, is I think you and I both believe that uh, culture is upstream of politics that the norms of culture, whether it's pop culture, I mean, the Grateful Dead, uh, or just, you know, everyday culture of how we treat each other and how we behave uh, in public, um, those norms um, are, are, they both are upstream of politics in the sense that they precede it, but they also determine what happens in politics, right? And a lot of our work at Citizen University um, centers around this idea of um, really trying to spread the belief that Democracy is on us, that a strong democracy requires strong citizens, right? And, and, and that is a, a bottom-up view. You know, Ella Baker, the great civil rights activist uh, at the time that Martin Luther King was rising and becoming already then this icon and this hero, this saint to so many, um, she regarded his rise with more than a little bit of skepticism. And she uttered a famous line that I often return to, which is, a strong people don't need strong leaders, right? Um, and there's a danger whenever you get a strong man, a strong leader, a charismatic right. figure arising that sort of suggests that the people are weak in some way, right? And I, I, I have, I, I agree with that. And I think a big part of what we've got to do is how do we strengthen the people, right? Our work at Citizen University, uh, in part, as you allude to, uh, is literally about teaching power, democratizing understanding of what power is, how it flows, what forms it takes, how you actually think about practicing it at the most local scale, right? Neighborhood, town, community. Uh, before, long before you think about national politics. Um, but the other piece that goes along with power um, in this conception of a strong people is character, right? To me, citizenship is power plus character. It's not just one uh, of those alone. And the character piece, um, what we're trying to do at Citizen University, we've been doing these gatherings that uh, uh, we actually going to get you to come and, and preach at one. It'll blow a lot of people's minds. It's called Civic Saturdays. Um, and, and I say preach because these gatherings are basically the civic equivalent to church uh, or to a faith gathering, right? It's not church or synagogue or mosque, uh, but it is about American civic religion. Uh, The idea that you and I share a creed uh, of civic values uh, and ideals. And we know in the case of like liberty versus equality or colorblind versus color conscious that the, the values of the creed are often in tension, right? And that the point of American life is not to achieve final victory for one side or the other, but to navigate that tension in healthy repeat play kinds of ways, right? And um, so we do these Civic Saturday gatherings uh, because our view is that you change hearts and minds. You, you lay down these patterns of norms and values, not in isolation, not one by one, but actually in shared experience, right? Uh, you, you love the dead not because you like putting on your headphones only and listening to the dead in isolation. You love the dead because you've been to dead concerts. You love that feeling of being with a community of people whose values it, and it norms. Doesn't, it doesn't work without the community. It doesn't work without the community, yeah. right? And, and, and that is a kind of a beautiful example of that kind of self-organizing capacity uh, in a community that shares values, has a sense of what its power is, um, both as creators and consumers of, uh, of, a, of an artistic experience, right? Um, and, uh, you know, our civic Saturday gatherings are very much about trying to foster that same spirit. And, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're in a big blue city like Seattle or a tiny town like Athens, Tennessee, um, you know, all these places around the country where civic Saturdays are starting to happen are just, um, a response to this need that I think your folks and my folks are feeling, which is wanting to be part of something bigger than themselves, wanting to make sense of, uh, the world right now. Uh, in something other than isolation. Your, um, uh, the speech I just watched that you gave, you talk about um, your, your parents' history and, and that they were immigrants from, from Taiwan. And 
and I don't, I don't know, I don't know the story, and I don't know if you'd be willing to tell it, but uh, you know, why, why did they leave China, and why did they come to America? And I, and and I, I'd love to hear your perspective because I think when you talk about that, it's really, it's really profound. Yeah. Um, so my parents were both born in mainland China. Um, uh, during the period of both the Chinese civil war between the communists and the nationalists, nationalists uh, but also the time of the Sino-Japanese war, right? So it was total chaos yeah. uh, that they were growing up in. And uh, um, my dad's family, uh, my, my father's father um, was uh, uh, in the Chinese Air Force, the nationalist Chinese Air Force. Um, he had, uh, and, and his name in Chinese is Liu Guoyun, um, Liu is the family name, and Guoyun basically means deliverance of the nation, right? So, you know, low pressure name, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but he grew up the son of a farmer, and when the Republic of China was created in 1911, he was a young man, and he decided to go to that to the Republic's first military academy, become a pilot, go into the Air Force, um, and so my father's family was on the move because of war. My mother's family, her dad was a professor um, of history. Um, and so they were on the move because during wartime, universities kept shutting down, you know, people kept fleeing cities because of one, uh, invasion or another. And so they were on the move all throughout. And, uh, um, it, uh, in 1949, when the communists finally won that civil war and the nationalists fled to Taiwan, uh, both my parents' families, uh, made that migration, uh, to Taiwan. And so then they spent the you know, their adolescence. They would have been about 12 or 13 when they fled to Taiwan. Um, and then the balance of their... So it's not an exaggeration to say that they were fleeing Mao um, because your one side of the family was on the other team. Was literally at war with Mao and the other but, knew very but, clearly But the that, universities were, were targeted yeah. and intellectuals were considered enemies of the people. Yeah, and actually my, my, my maternal grandfather... Um, had already seen the writing on the wall. He didn't wait till the last minute of fleeing. He actually moved to Taiwan maybe in 48. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, but my dad's family, I mean, they were among the last to go because, uh, um, you know, the, they, they didn't want to give up the fight till they had to. Um, but they, they grew up in, in Taipei. Uh, they didn't know each other. Uh, they didn't know each other till each of them migrated to the United States in the late 1950s. And to your question, they both came to the United States uh, for a simple reason that's as old as immigration uh, history itself, which was uh, education. Yeah. Uh, you know, to actually uh, get a better opportunity in, in Taiwan. Um, you know, I mean, imagine you, you, you've, uh, an entire part of a population has fled to an island and you've got to start setting up institutions uh, from scratch. Um, there was Taiwan University there, uh, uh, and my mom ended up going to Taiwan University and, and not coming to the United States till after she'd finished there. But my dad um, uh, felt like, no, I need to actually, you know, see the wider world. And uh, he left Taiwan when he was 18. Yeah. Uh, he came to the United States. He had a brother um, who was already in the United States in South Dakota, going to the South Dakota School of Mines, um, because that's just a place he could get in. And uh, and my dad lived with him for a little while in South Dakota. His, his first job uh, there was painting the yellow line down a, a, a highway in a, a road in South Dakota. Um, and he ended up eventually going to, to college in, in the U.S., right? And so um, they got their educations here. Um, they ended up meeting um, in New York. Uh, um, and I and ended up, uh, my dad, many years later, uh, after getting his degrees, um, got a job at IBM. Uh, and that's how I ended up growing up in Poughkeepsie, New York, in the Hudson Valley, because that was a big IBM town, right? But and that whole journey... Um, you know, it was very suburban, very American dream. IBM was a secure big company. Um, but it's kind of remarkable to think that at the time we moved there in 19, you know, in the, in the 1970s, um, you know, my dad was only less than two decades away um, from having uh, left Taiwan as an 18 year old kid yeah. with not a whole lot uh, 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 certain about his future. So that's I mean, to me, that's a classic American dream type story. Um, but, but you, you talk about, you, you talk about your, your, your family's journey as, as a way to talk about your, your privilege mm -hmm. and this, and, and let's, let's have a, you, you love to say, let's have better arguments. Um, <laughs> um, uh, the, the notion of privilege, uh, triggers conservatives, mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and I'm not sure they understand it, but, uh, you explaining it, um, helped me at least understand 
better how you think about it. Tell, tell me about your privilege. Yeah. So to me, privileged is the unearned benefit of prior allocations of power, right? Um, you and I are in a society right now, as most societies in the world are, where just because we got born male, we have a certain measure of privilege. Um, uh, that doesn't mean that um, all the time we get advantages, but it means that uh, um, we got dealt a slightly more favorable hand on average um, than many women would in many life opportunities. Th that's just, uh, we didn't earn that, right? And, and the most salient version of that for me as the child of immigrants, um, as a second generation American, I feel very acutely. My parents rarely said this out loud, but there was this vibe in the household all the time where they expressed this norm, which was um, that they had done all the heavy lifting, right? They, they had made the sacrifices. They'd taken the great risks. They'd come to this country to build a life. And all I had done was to have the dumb luck to be born here, right? <laughs> to, uh, to the dumb luck to be born here in 1968 at the peak of American power, at a company at the peak of its power uh, in a company town. Um, I didn't earn any of that, right? Um, right? And so this message throughout my childhood was basically earn it. Um, what are you going to do? Every opportunity you've been given comes with a certain uh, uh, countervailing uh, uh, obligation uh, to be useful, to contribute, right? And, um, and, you know, I think one way to tell my parents' story um, is a story of rugged individualism. And look, they each have, and my, my dad passed away many years ago now, but they each have or had a great deal of gumption and personal initiative and grit and all those things that we like to admire in so It's a very stories. Randian story. Yeah, th there, there is that. Yeah. Uh, and. And. And, right? Um, uh, my dad's education was at uh, um, the University of Illinois and the University of Michigan. So two great public institutions of higher education. Um, my uh, dad, uh, when he was uh, not even 40, was diagnosed with end-stage kidney disease. Uh, he spent the last 14 years of his life um, on home dialysis. Uh, and, you know, at the time when he first got diagnosed, in many cases, that was a near death sentence. Like, you know, you don't have a lot longer. And um, he was able to get home dialysis. He was able to get that care. He was able to live another 14 years, um, not just because of his grit and his gumption and his personal fortitude, uh, but because Medicare existed uh, and Medicare covered uh, home dialysis for end-stage kidney disease, right? Absent Medicare, um, my family would have shattered uh, w w when I was a much younger kid, right? And our family's life chances and capacity for opportunity would have changed. Um, I, as the child of immigrants and the public, a product of public schools, um, I lived in a community that, uh, yeah, it was a company town, but that company uh, itself was the, uh, was the beneficiary of huge uh, public contracts, IBM, right? Um, and so, again, it's not to say that my life is a socialist life, uh, but but it, it is. it would be as wrong to say that as to say that my parents lived uh, purely the Randian archetype uh, of the rugged individual, right? It, it is this interweaving uh, of the individual and the collective uh, of your spark and our collective responsibility to make sure that everybody gets a chance to express their spark um, that makes the dream uh, worth Let, pursuing. Let's let's get back to that trade-off because the the argument that you've made is is about about growing inequality and you know the rich get richer and the top one percent um, have too much power. Is that a fair characterization of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, and I, let's accept that's true. I, I think um, I've I've read. I mean, that's not an opinion. That's just a statement of statistical fact. So, the rich have gotten richer. and uh, So, so Piketty, <clears throat> Piketty, the, the much uh, maligned uh, Piketty perspective. Um, <laughs> In um, my circles, the much admired and quoted right, Piketty. Right, yeah. <laughs> and I, I've read plenty of papers that, that sort of uh, uh, parse his data and, and, and tell yeah. a very different story. But, but clearly, I mean, the, the thing that we don't have to argue about is that um, there are billionaires and there are people making twenty thousand dollars a year, and that's that's quite a gap. Um, and it's certainly true with with the rise of 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 I would argue democratization and technology created opportunities like Amazon. Sure, you know that that wouldn't have happened um, 
w would it not have been for the zillions of customers that Amazon can can serve and mm -hmm. and, and, and and reach without friction and yeah, yeah. reduce transaction costs um, or yeah. But it, but at <clears> the <throat> same time, it uh, it's it's also indisputable that um, the poorest of the poor are better off today. The World Bank, um, which is not a horribly conservative or libertarian institution, has said, and I'll probably butcher the data, but but I feel like in the last thirty years. Um, uh, seventy-four percent of the poorest of the poor, and and their standard is a buck ninety a day. Right, that's pretty poor. Yeah. Um, seventy-four percent have gotten out of poverty, and and I'll quote the the great economist Bono on this, and he says that capitalism is far more effective than any other of the isms mm -hmm. in lifting people out of poverty. And then he, then he went on, and, th and this was controversial amongst conservatives because then he, then he went on to describe capitalism as amoral and a beast that, need, that needed to be tamed and, and all that stuff. But there's, there's clearly something happening that's lifting people out of poverty. And I don't think that's from <clears throat> planning. I, th I think it's from people being freer to feed themselves. Do yeah. you agree or disagree? Uh, I agree in large measure that uh, capitalism is, you know, the the greatest human invention for the solving of problems and uh, and the creation of uh, wealth, both individual and common wealth. Yeah. Um, what what I also believe is that capitalism, um, left completely unbound, tends forget about moral amoral. It, just in the nature of complex adaptive systems, back to gardens, it is, it is the nature of systems that left completely untended, they will tend toward clumping and concentration of resource. Uh, that's true in a garden. It's true in an ecosystem. It's true in an economy. That, that Again, um, and, and I think that that, um, you know, that you can hold those two beliefs in your mind at the same time, right? I, I'm, uh, I, I'm a capitalist. Uh, I, I think capitalism... Uh, uh, true capitalism is a powerful force for good. But I think the problem that we have in the United States is that we don't have true capitalism. To me, true capitalism is the idea that every single fit and able competitor can get on the field and compete. And we don't have a society where every fit and able competitor can get on the field and compete, right? We have both because we are under-investing in the potential of some competitors and because other competitors have rigged the game to keep competition off the field right right we have a very distorted system right now right and, and, and some I, of that's and left and some of that. that's right right i, I, I agree with <clears throat> that and uh you know and so i, I look I, I as to your point about the global context um it's true that from a global perspective the poorest of the poor making a buck 90 a day um that these are that we live in a time of great opportunity and um, great uplift for the the poor, the bottom billion, as they say, right? Yeah. Um, the challenge is, in you know, when we get back to American politics, uh, American politics is about life within this particular bounded set called Americans, and uh, it is another aspect of human nature that all status is relative, right? It's cold comfort to somebody um, who's making seven bucks an hour in the United States, trying to live in this society. It's cold comfort to them to tell them that. Um, you're making orders of magnitude more than the poorest person um, in Southeast Asia or Africa right now, right? That, that, that may be intellectually true to them, but it doesn't mean anything to them um, in terms of the social sentiments and the moral sentiments of I'm part of a community in which my dignity, value, worth, and sense of b belonging in place is all relative, right? Um, the, the coal miners in Appalachia, uh, laid off steel workers um, are still in their homes, with their cars, with cell phones, um, so many times more wealthy uh, th th than the poorest of the poor uh, in Africa. And that is just of or, no or, consolation whatsoever. Or, or right? their parents or their grandparents. And Sure, but again, the, the, the relative, uh, that, that sense of relative status uh, is not uh, in time, right? It's also cold comfort to know that you're, you're, you're doing better than people 100 years ago whose life expectancy was, you know, in their 40s and uh, so on and so forth. Like, we're here and we're now, right? And here and now, um, and you can quarrel with, uh, I, I haven't seen these studies that pick apart Piketty, uh, but, uh, but, but I do think, again, we feel it in our bones and there, I think, think there are indisputable 
um, Shockingly, uh, I found one on NPR, yeah. of all places. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. But I think the reality is that, you know, I mean, the one that I often quote is that in 1980, um, the, the wealthiest 1% accounted for 8% of national income, right? And by 2014, that same 1% accounted for 22, 23% of national income, right? Is some of that because of innovation technology? You bet. Uh, but a lot of that is about the financialization of our economy and the rigging of rules to reward the already privileged. Right? So let's let's talk about and, and and let's wrap up with this because this this is the tension where we'll always argue, and and we're really arguing about concentration of power, and and when I hear rigging, which of, we both hate, yeah, we right? hate, we both we, hate, we both hate, we both hate monopoly. Power. Yes, uh, you hate. I mean, truly, we both hate monopoly. Yes, and I think that is to me the basis of a cross ideological cross partisan movement of the future which is do you hate opportunity monopolies do you hate people who are hoard, people and institutions who are hoarding opportunity um, if you do join us right and you might have some tools for busting those monopolies that look different from my tools uh, but our we share this belief that um, when you break down the walls that hoarders have built around them and actually make sure that power, voice, opportunity, wealth are circulating far more widely through the through the body politic, right? Right. That the whole body ends up being healthier, right? And I think we are. Um, I don't. I don't feel like we're arguing about that. I think we're actually. Um, you know, the, the arguments that we're in in American politics today are between folks who agree with what we just said there. And folks who feel like, no, I kind of like how things are hoarded and I kind of like this arrangement. And what would I have to give up if uh, um, and, and I think that's the interesting axis that is not left or right, but it is um, hoarder versus non hoarder. Well, I love to I love to compare uh, Ron Paul and Bernie Sanders. And it upsets some of my Ron Paul friends when I say, you know, they, they have more in common than than perhaps you appreciate. And you go look at it. And, and by the way, you could look at AOC's uh, first viral video and I'm nodding my head yes, right up until the point where she's saying, that's why we need Medicare for all, that's why we need this and that and the other. Um, and both Ron Paul and Bernie Sanders are raging against concentrated power. Mm -hmm. You know, They talk about mass incarceration, and they talk about permanent war, and they talk about crony capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, and if, but of course, they have very different prescriptions on, on what to do about it. And I, and I think the dilemma for, if, if you're worried about concentrated market power, I always follow the breadcrumbs back to some, some special deal they got in Washington because Jeff Bezos has more juice than you and I. We're, we're a couple of blocks from the Capitol and I'm guessing he can get a meeting that I can't get and, and he probably has opinions about how to keep the next Amazon from, from competing with him. Mm -hmm. So the, the dilemma, when, when you're rearranging things through government, the dilemma is that there's always a middleman, there's always someone powerful that's going to rig that system. And, and that's why my bias is towards liberty, because, because I, th I think that insiders in business, in government, collude with each other to rig the system. And mm -hmm. I don't know how to stop that without limiting the size of government. Mm -hmm. You know, I think... Uh, and I agree in large part with that, but to me, um, you know, to me it is unavoidable that people uh, will collude to try to rig and change the rules um, to entrench themselves. Uh, Adam it, Smith. It, it, it is unavoidable because we have those rules. That's one of the unfortunate things we have to accept with the rule of law, right? Societies that don't have the rule of law, it's just pure mob rule or mafia rule kind of we will control and we will use violence uh, uh, to, to enforce, uh, enforce these norms and there is no rule of law. Because we have a set of rules um, and a set of institutions that in theory is supposed to be open and equal to all, um, yeah, it's possible for some people to kind of corral it and, and rig it. But that, again, underscores why it's necessary for people, whether they're Tea Party folks, libertarians, um, or progressive activists, uh, even socialists, um, who are interested in activating bottom-up power to insert themselves into uh, making sure those rules don't get co-opted. Um, you know, to me, the answer uh, to the dilemma that you're, or the problem that you're solving isn't necessarily smaller government. The answer is more participation in the, in the making and the keeping of the rules, right? We can debate separately about 
you know, the pros and cons of small or big government and scale sometimes is bad and scale sometimes is good. But to me, the main thing that I take away from your diagnosis, which I agree with, um, is that we all got to show up more. We all got to participate more and we all got to take more ownership uh, and be more watchful and vigilant about, hey, hold on. Th this dude is trying to bend the rule uh, to reward him and his cronies. Right. And, th and that's I'm not OK with that. Right. Uh, and uh, and again, that's where you see a lot of convergence on, on left and right, um, even though they're the people they're pointing at might be different. Uh, but that instinct that they're seeing that that's not right, uh, that someone is trying to cut a private deal uh, for what ought to be public rules. Um, that instinct is, uh, is something we got to listen to and add some, you know, s some oxygen to that fire. I agree with you, and I think that's a perfect way to end this with something <laughs> that we agree on. Thank you so much Thanks, for doing Matt. this, and I, I think we may have to do it again because there's more to work out. There is, and I, I really uh, just always enjoy hanging out uh, and, and uh, uh, pulling apart these ideas with you. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Thanks again. Yep. Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.